Parametric down conversion is a process that's very important to us. The reason is it's a very special light source. It creates light two photons at a time. You have a nonlinear material, this is in case it's a, uh, an optical crystal, and you send in light at one frequency or color or wavelength, and what you get are a pair of beams out that are uh, lower in energy than the in incident beam, but the sum of the energy of these two output photons equals the energy of the input, and of course the momentum of these two has to equal the momentum of the uh, input photons. This is a nonlinear process. It's relatively weak, so what that means is most of the time this light comes in and goes right through, but on occasion, perhaps one in a million or one in a billion times, one of these photons breaks up into pairs such as shown there. And the important thing is that if I see this one, I know that the other guy has to be there. One solution would be you could produce a pair of photons at half the energy or twice the wavelength, 702 nanometers. And if you do that, they would come out. So this is a graph here of wavelength versus output angle. So you would get a pair of photons at 702 at plus or minus 2 degrees. Or you could have a pair at a, uh, with more energy and shorter wavelength here. This is around 600. And its twin with the remaining energy is around 950 nanometers. And they would come out at uh, maybe 3 degrees and uh, 5 degrees. Okay. So what can you do with this special source of light where you're creating photons two at a time. The most obvious application is to use it to measure the efficiency of a photon counting detector. That is, uh, what's the probability that if a photon goes in, I will get a click coming out of my detector? And the way you do it is you put a photon counting detector in both of these beam paths. And whenever this detector clicks, you know that there must be a photon have come into that detector, and you know that there must be a twin over there, and you look to see if your detector clicked or not. And if 87% of the time that this guy clicks, that this clicks in conjunction, then you know the efficiency of this is 87%, and more or less you're finished. Uh, so here is an example of this, uh, one of these nonlinear crystals. In this case, this is a uh, 100 millimeter long crystal is particularly long, but you can see that you can see through it, and uh, it's pretty much clear, which jives with the fact that the nonlinearity is relatively low, in that uh, only one in a billion photons that comes through gets scattered, or in fact, or it could even be less, but that one in a billion or one in a trillion even is actually very useful. That's our signal. And that's important because we're looking at light at one photon at a time uh, levels as opposed to what you typically see in daylight where a watt of optical power would be 10 to the 19 photons a second. So one photon is a particularly low level. And in fact, you might wonder, how do you detect a one, uh, one photon with something like this? This is a photomultiplier tube. It's a vacuum tube, and if you look on the, uh, if you look on the end, this rectangle it represents a uh, an specially designed surface where photons come in, and it kicks off electrons. This is the photoelectric effect, which was. This is a lab where we do an experiment with this two-photon light. Uh, this is uh, at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And this is an example of one of those uh, nonlinear crystals where one photon goes in and two comes out. You can see it's a, uh, in this case, about a 15 millimeter square, rather short crystal. The beam comes in uh, along this path here. 
This actually lets us adjust the polarization of that incoming beam. But we've made for the output a, an optical setup that allows us to easily look at light coming out at particular angles. So that's uh, uh, done through these bars, which are pivoted on this point here. Here you can actually see this apparatus in motion here. As we move one of these arms, we're changing the angle, but the optical path is still looking at that crystal, which is what we need. And it's held together by uh, rubber bands against this micrometer, and, and then this other arm uh, does the same. So this allows us to continually look at the crystal while uh, changing the angle, and that changes the frequency or the color of the output light. And then these uh, uh, collection optics here go into optical fibers and goes to the rest of our experiment. These two optical pads where we're collecting light are just two optical pads of uh, this down-converted pair light that we're collecting. In fact, this source here, this crystal, is producing pairs at all azimuths around the pump direction. So if you were to take your eye and look directly up into this crystal when the laser was on, and of course block the pump laser because it's uh, bright and would be harmful to your eyes, and you set things up just right, you would actually see that ring of light uh, uh, covering the, the full spectrum, and you would see it spread out over a range of angles separated from the pump, uh, depending on how you tilted that crystal. And that's where that beautiful picture was taken. And in fact, that's the way it was taken, by putting a camera on axis and setting up a filter to block just the ultraviolet input beam so you can just see the down converted light. And then we tilted it as uh, we were monitoring it with that camera to get those different set of pictures. This relates to our efforts ongoing in the Joint Quantum Institute, where we have one experiment where we are trying to connect light that's produced by these parametric down conversion crystals and be able to take one of those photons and its quantum state and actually hold on to it and store it. The issue is if it's a photon that's traveling at the speed of light, it's hard to hold on to it for a long period of time. So there are techniques to, to store those states in an atomic or ionic state, so it's basically solid material that you can hold on to. The problem is that those tend to be uh, able to store states that have that are in a very restricted range of frequencies or wavelengths. While the down conversion light is produced broadband, you can see it uh, covers the full visible spectrum. So how do you get your light, which covers such a wide range, into a narrow range that can be taken up by this solid state states, solid state systems? And in fact, we have a project that's dealing specifically with that, where we're tailoring these systems to be very narrow band for those applications. Thank you.